Welcome to recorded lecture for Unit 5 and Unit 6 for the Anatomy and Physiology 1 lab students. Uh, now, we have already talked about the first two tissue types in this histology unit, Unit 5. Uh, we talked about epithelial tissues, we talked about nervous tissue. Remember, there are two other tissue types that exist, and these are the connective tissues and muscle tissues. So those are we're going to talk about today. Um, for every component of histology, remember that whatever you see on the slides, whatever you see under a microscope, uh, it's all about using descriptive visual terminology. So if you see a lot of cells on the slides, if you see multiple layers or different shapes of the cells, uh, we use the accepted histological terminology to describe them so that others can understand what you're seeing under a microscope. For connective tissue types, um, there's multiple different varieties. We're going to sort of split them into two basic kinds. So unlike epithelial tissues where you saw lots and lots of cells when you saw them on a slide, connective tissues actually do not have lots of cells usually. They mostly have the filler material consisting of support proteins like collagen, elastic fibers, and other types of protein type material that fills up the space and so you should not be looking for actual cells on the slide uh, when you're looking at connective tissue but looking for more specific features depending on uh, what what kind of a specimen it is so most important type of cell that you find in connective tissue are what's called fibroblasts these are cells that actually synthesize and produce collagen there are multiple collagen type varieties these are long proteins that provide strength and stability to everything from skin to your bones and many other connective tissue components. So collagen is very, very important. Fibroblasts, again, are the cells producing collagen, and we'll see collagen pretty much in every single example of connective tissue, uh, with few exceptions. So most abundant uh, connective tissue varieties, the simple ones, I'm going to give you the name of the tissue and in parentheses an example that you need to know where you can find this. So the first one, if you're seeing loose fibers, loosely arranged fibers on the slide, right, they usually are basically collagen fibers, they're kind of pink in color. Uh, we just call it loose connective tissue. Basement membrane of uh, under epithelial cells is very commonly, we find that when we talked about basement membrane in our earlier histology lecture, uh, so common common appearance sometimes though you will see lots of collagen fibers so kind of densely packed together if they have a pattern to them so they're not just sort of thrown randomly on the slide but have a pattern to their appearance uh, we can call this dense regular connective tissue that means uh, there's lots of collagen fibers on the slide and they're densely packed together in a regular pattern usually we see this in tendons uh, as part of the skeletal system, uh, musculoskeletal system. So tendons are those connections between a muscle and a bone, like an Achilles tendon in your heel. And so when you see a tendon under a microscope, you would see that it consists of dense, regular connective tissue. Uh, another example, very similar, except now the fibers are irregularly arranged. So there's kind of more randomness to that slide, to that appearance of the specimen. Something we call dense, irregular connective tissue usually something we see in the dermis, which is the lower portion in your skin. We're going to talk about this later today uh, with our skin chapter. So when you see the dermis, you see dense irregular connective tissue, usually we have very specific appearance that you'll see uh, in the images. Uh, sometimes also you might see a different collection of fibers and what we call reticular fibers and reticular connective tissue they have a web-like appearance they're usually darkly stained on the slide and the spleen is the organ uh, which is part of the immune system which best characterizes this kind of an example um, so uh, not very commonly seen in the body but uh, when you see a reticular connective tissue the example that you guys should know is the spleen basically uh, adipose tissue is basically the fat stored in the body. Adipose has very unique appearance as its cells that have been uh, kind of emptied out of their lipid component of the fat. So it look like sort of outlines of cells of a peripheral uh, nucleus on the sides. Um, and a very unique appearance, usually very easy to recognize. 
basically anywhere in the body where we have fat stored, like we call this histologically adipose tissue. And the last one, a regular elastic connective tissue, basically you're thinking of elastic fibers, where these are stretchable kind of rubber band like fibers that provide elasticity to your skin and other organs, and especially important in blood vessels, as we, as we realize, because blood vessels do need to constrict and dilate as blood is going through them. And we'll see more of that when we look at uh, blood vessels later on in the semester. Again, these will have elastic connective tissue or dense regular elastic connective uh, fibers. Now, there's also specialized forms of connective tissue that are very important, and these are probably more easily recognizable by, uh, by most people. And this is essentially keeping in mind here that both cartilage, bone, and even blood are all forms of connective tissue in the body from the histological perspective. <clears throat> Again, obviously they are very different. So when you see these images, when you see these slides, they will have a different appearance. That's how connective tissue always is. You're not looking for the same similar kind of collection of cells like we saw in the epithelial slide. This is gonna look quite a bit different. So the goal is to kind of understand the general appearance and then kind of remember what that looks like depending on the specimen. So for cartilage, we have actually three cartilage types in the body. Cartilage is the component fine in most joints in order to soften and kind of reduce the friction when the bones are rubbing against each other as part of movement. Uh, the main cell type in all cartilage is chondrocytes. Chondrocytes are the primary cell that actually synthesizes all the normal components that go into making cartilage. And the actual cartilage varieties are from the most common to least common is hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fiber cartilage. Hyaline is the most common one for regular joints, so joints in your fingers, in the wrist, in the elbows, knees, everywhere else would be hyaline type cartilage, usually has a bluish or sort of pinkish appearance depending on the staining method. Uh, and again, very common, you will see the chondrocytes there and uh, kind of looking for them when you're looking at the kind of musculoskeletal type specimens. Elastic cartilage is found in a few locations such as the external ear, for instance, and the epiglottis in the respiratory system. And fibrocartilage is primarily found in the intervertebral discs in the spinal column. So the vertebra, which are the bones protecting the spinal cord and allowing us to stand up straight and kind of connect the whole skeleton. So those cushions between the bones, between the vertebra are called intervertebral discs and they histologically consist of fibrocartilage, which is just a kind of a tougher cartilage material, again, that is suited for that kind of purpose uh, uh, in that case. When we talk about bones, which will be an entire chapter on that, obviously, uh, we will talk about osteocytes. These are regular living bone cells. We don't want to forget that bone is actually a living organ material, consists of blood vessels and nerves and needs support. Uh, in terms of the nutrients and the physical support, just like any other organ. So the main cell types are osteocytes. Osteo, anything like osteology, study of bones, reminds you that we're talking about bones here. And sometimes we also call it osseous tissue, uh, OSS, like that. Uh, sometimes you'll see that. But essentially, we'll get into the histology much more in depth and naming of the bones later in, uh, later in the semester. And for the blood, blood obviously right, is a fluid traveling through our blood vessels as pumped by the heart. Uh, blood is a type of connective tissue as well and consists of the liquid component, which is basically water. That's the plasma of the blood or blood plasma. And that is really the ECM or the extracellular component, uh, extracellular matrix as we already talked about in the different lecture. Uh, just like we have ECM for epithelial tissue that kind of supports epithelial cells, that basement membrane, basal lamina that we talked about. ECM also supports the rest of the blood, which are obviously most important, are the blood cells. There are three main types of blood cells. the are RBCs, WBCs, and platelets. RBCs are the red blood cells that carry oxygen, carry hemoglobin, bound to oxygen to make sure that oxygen reaches all the cells in the body as part of normal cell function. WBCs, which are white blood cells, 
these are essentially large cells in the blood uh, of different varieties that all help us as part of the immune defense, as part of our uh, protecting the body, fighting against microbes, infections, viruses, and bacteria, and other uh, problems, including fighting against things like allergies and tumors even. We'll go into this much more in the blood chapter later on in the semester. Uh, and the last component are platelets, which are small fragments of cells. Uh, again, all originating from the bone marrow, so blood components are made in the bone marrow. So our platelets, red blood cells, white blood cells, all of these. And the bone marrow produces these cell fragments and they go out into the blood and allow for blood clotting. So when the platelets notice that there's a break in the blood vessel, there's bleeding occurring, right, to prevent hemorrhage, to prevent a person from losing their blood, a blood clotting mechanism needs to be activated. It has multiple components, including plasma proteins and others. But a very important component for us now are the platelets, which are sticky and essentially find that break in the blood vessels and physically block off that area so bleeding can stop. Now, for the last muscle, uh, for the last tissue, we have the muscle tissue, the last uh, of the four tissue varieties. Again, epithelial, nervous, connective tissue are the ones we already talked about. The last one is muscle tissue. There are three muscle varieties that we have in the body. We have skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle. We will talk about them more individually later on uh, in other chapters. For now, briefly, in terms of the histology, we want to keep in mind that uh, all these three types can be categorized as either voluntary or involuntary muscles. Voluntary are those we consciously control. So when you pick up an object, like I'm picking up this marker and saying, yes, I'm picking up the marker with my muscles, right? That's voluntary control. And involuntary are those functions that are taking place. They're moving things throughout the body, but you're not consciously thinking about that. It's just taking place through other mechanisms, unconsciously, basically. So <clears throat> of these three, the skeletal muscle is the only one that is voluntary muscle. Smooth muscle is involuntary, cardiac muscle is involuntary. Cardiac, remember, is in the heart. Smooth muscle, I'm gonna indicate what the locations are soon. Skeletal muscle, right, is the simplest one, the one that we are most, uh, should be most familiar with for everyone. That's basically the muscles attached to our bones. Uh, there are many, many hundreds, really, of different skeletal muscles that we have in the body. We will go over some of them uh, in the skeletal muscle chapter later in the semester. Uh, for now, the way to separate these would be basically to indicate two or three main components. We want to say, when you're looking at these muscles, even though they all look kind of similar, uh, do they have lines going through these muscles? These are called striations, indicating that yes, there are proteins actually inside that do the movement. For skeletal muscles, yes, the striations are actually the most visible, very obvious, and they are there even under relatively low magnification, you can see them on the slides. Uh, and these cells are very large, they're multinucleated cells, meaning more than one nucleus is present, uh, and that's because they're so big and they need kind of extra DNA, extra material, extra resources essentially to allow for their function, right? Remember some of them, our muscles uh, extend through almost the entire size of the bones, right? If imagining like your leg muscles and others, right? So they're very long, very large muscle fibers, and so they need this multinucleated Kind of, uh, uh, they have this multi-nucleate appearance to them. For the smooth muscle, we have no striations. This is in fact why it's called smooth muscle, right? So you see basically just uniformly pink, uh, large cells, or sometimes smaller size cells, but basically you will not see any lines, any striations, and essentially it's one nucleus per cell there. Um, now, most important for us here is that where do you see smooth muscle? Ideally, Right, and the basic slide you should be able to recognize is in the digestive tract, so in the stomach, in the intestines, everywhere where the food needs to be passed through, in the esophagus early on, before the stomach. Basically, the entire digestive tract primarily will have smooth muscle there, right? So as the food is being pushed along there as part of digestion, it's the smooth muscle contractions that allow us to do this. Also, smooth muscle is found in the urinary tract, in the reproductive system, like in the uterus, in the female uh, and in the bladder uh, for both male and female. 
uh, and certain other locations as well. Think about like the pupil in the eye that allows us, right? So the iris to kind of expand to let the pupil get the more light in or sort of close to constrict the pupil. Again, that muscle doing that inside the eye is a type of smooth muscle as well. So again, all of these are most importantly are involuntary type of muscles. The body controls the smooth muscle through autonomic nervous system that sends the signal, but you are not consciously telling your smooth muscles to contract. Uh, it's done through other mechanisms. <clears throat> and the last one here, the cardiac muscle, right, very important as part of the heart. Only the heart has the cardiac muscle, right? So it's kind of very special, very unique feature uh, for this particular histological example. Um, and the actual muscle cells of the heart are called cardiomyocytes. Uh, and when you see them under the microscope, these are striated cells. They are one nucleus cells, right? So regular type of cells like we commonly see. Uh, and then they will also have this unique feature, which is called intercalated discs, which are these protein <clears throat> connections, kind of like gap junctions that essentially allow um, faster communication between the cells. <clears throat> and thinking about how the heart muscles need to contract in unison as the heart needs to be very efficient about pumping the blood. So it makes sense that they want to have these tight connections, faster communication, between the cells, and so each cardiomyocyte is connected to another through these intercalated discs. Again, when you see them on a slide or in an image, they will appear as these sort of these dark, kind of kind of stained little uh, areas, and perpendicular usually to the striations in the muscle. <clears throat> Again, we have three muscle types: skeletal smooth cardiac, skeletal is voluntary, smooth is involuntary also involuntary. Make sure to review all of this in the book and see the illustrations and the pictures. Uh, and obviously we want to look at the slides as well to see what they look like as part of normal histology. Now for the next chapter, this is called the integumentary chapter in the book. Basically we're just going to call it the skin chapter. Uh, integumentary is like a essentially a term that's referring to the skin and all the accessory structures in the skin. Uh, now, when we're thinking of the skin, we think of anything that is derm, like dermatology is skin, something that is cutaneous is also referring to the skin. These are useful terms to know. So like a dermatologist is obviously the physician or a doctor who treats skin disorders. Now, from a basic perspective, uh, without any kind of special pathology, Skin obviously is very important in histologic slides. You should always be able to recognize skin multiple layers there. We have nice illustrations in the lab manual to show you that in the textbook. Uh, basically, there are three main layers of the skin. The upper, the top layer is the epidermis. Uh, that's a relatively small layer uh, relative to the size of others. Then the much bigger layer, the dermis. And then the deepest one is the hypodermis. Of these three, the epidermis and dermis are much, much more important. This is the true skin that we're essentially talking about here. The hypodermis, uh, hypo, remember, means below, right? Epi means above, right? That's why epidermis is the top layer. Hypo is like the lower layer. And hypodermis, I'm gonna be calling usually just subcutis or subcutaneous tissue. Uh, and this is just containing essentially that adipose that we mentioned before uh, as fat. Okay, so it's just fat. So basically when you're thinking about all the layers, if you're sort of like doing like a biopsy, uh, you go through multiple layers. So epidermis, dermis, then hypodermis underneath will be just the muscle basically, and then bone. Okay, if you're like sort of digging through from the top to the bottom. Uh, so again, I'm gonna focus on epidermis and dermis primarily. So let's talk about the dermis first, right? This is the largest component. Uh, keep in mind, what is dermis actually histologically? It mostly consists of dense, irregular connective tissue, as like the background. And then internal structures are all the basic things we know that the skin needs. So blood vessels, nerves, glands, other components, all will be inside the dermis, right? This is how the dermis allows the skin to survive, allows the higher up levels of cells, epithelial cells in the epidermis to function, to get the nutrients, to get pretty much everything, okay? 
So uh, again, blood vessels, nerves, glands, other structures are all in the dermis. Now, particularly a uh, good way to separate the dermis is to say that the upper portion of this kind of wavy line as you'll see on the slides is the papillary dermis and all the rest of the components, the bigger portion is the reticular dermis. And this is the one that consists of uh, sweat glands, hair follicles, uh, which is the origin point where the root of the hair kind of coming out from those deep portions in the skin, okay, uh, the living component of the hair, and also some unique features like these corpuscles. Corpuscles just means little body. These are very small, actually kind of hard to see under a microscope sometimes, but you might see them in some images. And there's two main types, all connected to nerve endings to the nervous system. One is for detecting light touch, and that's the Meissner's corpuscles, and another is to detect pressure or vibration, and that's the Pacinian corpuscles. When we deal with the epidermis, right, that's the upper portion. Remember, epidermis is primarily histologically epithelial cells. There are squamous, flat cells. They're stratified, and they're basically, again, stratified, squamous, keratinized epithelium. That is the kind of epithelium you find in the epidermis, in the skin. Now, there are different varieties of skin. There's thick skin and thin skin. Uh, generally, right, uh, skin consists of multiple of these epithelial layers. We want to kind of focus on two primary layers, the very top layer and the bottom layer of the epidermis. The bottom layer is the most important one. That's the stratum basale or basal layer. This is the one that's mitotically active, meaning mitosis is taking place there, cell division. New cells are constantly generated and produced, just like we talked about already in cell division uh, chapter. Uh, and other layers, as they continue on, right, they're kind of rising through at the, until they reach the very, very top, after going through about four or five layers. And we get to the top layer, which is the stratum corneum corneum or cornified layer, this is a layer essentially of those keratinized dead cells that could be sloughed off right, uh, as uh, they're no longer needed, right? Again, why are they dead cells? It's because essentially, remember the blood vessels are actually located deep inside. There are no blood vessels in the epidermis of cells. So the cells closest to them, they will get the nutrients, the far away cells, the nutrients cannot diffuse through such long distances. And so this is the stratum corneum. The, the, the layer of dead cells. But that's okay, right? That's how the keratin is actually protecting us on top, and you will see that on the slides and the images. Now, uh, we can also talk about epidermis from a different perspective, what kind of actual individual name cells we have there. So for instance, we have keratinocytes, right? These are the regular cells actually producing keratin. Again, that important protective component that uh, shields us from the sunlight protects us from wind and all kinds of external damage to the environment, right? So the very top layer is keratin on the skin. Keratinocytes produce this keratin. And we also have skin pigmentation and very important protein that needs to be produced, which is melanin. And so melanocytes are the cells that produce melanin. They're located primarily in the deeper stratum basale layer. And then as they produce melanin, melanin kind of gets uh, injected into other cells and go through the rest of the epithelial layers there, going to the top. Melanin is there to shield the DNA of the nucleus from direct sunlight. So everyone has melanin, everyone has the same number of melanocytes regardless of your skin color. If your skin color is darker, that means your ancestors most likely lived closer to the equator in those areas geographically on Earth where the sun strikes the Earth more directly and the sunlight is more damaging. So more melanin and tougher sort of type of melanin needs to be produced there. So genetically, right, that's the kind of melanin you have. And if, if you're lighter skin, then most likely that your ancestors, again, came from climates and those areas geographically much farther north away from the equator where the sun strikes the earth at a different angle where it's sort of less damaging, less sun is there. And so, Again, even though you still obviously have the same number of melanocytes, melanin produced sometimes of a different variety. It's sort of uh, less dark or basically fewer quantities of melanin and the skin appears lighter because of that. Um, 
Now for the accessory structures, basically we're talking about hair and nails here. Uh, so you'll see that in the book, what these structures look like. Uh, I want to mention primarily the glands. So there are sweat glands, actually different varieties uh, that are found in the skin, right? So depending on different areas, uh, and you know, we need sweat obviously uh, as part of get, getting rid of extra, um, as part of perspiration, as part of cooling down the body. Um, and also keep in mind that, so sweat is basically a liquid, a watery based component. And then there's other types of glands that produce instead of water-based secretion, produce actually oil-based secretions. And these are the sebaceous glands. Uh, a lot of them are found in the face, right? So when you see you have like oily face, uh, oily secretions, these are protective secretions made by sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands could be found next to hair follicles usually on the slide and will look very different from the sweat glands, right? So they, they just cannot be confused because they have very different appearance, kind of different location, but they are found uh, in the dermis, right, in the skin. Uh, now keep in mind also, uh, very importantly, there are many functions of our skin, right? There are many different ways of kind of describing this, but primary simple kind of summary of these functions is that the skin is there to protect us, to act as a physical barrier, the skin is there to allow for sensation, right? So when you're touching surfaces, when you're feeling things, right? The nerve endings of your nervous system are in the skin. And it's because of these different connections, these different receptors in the skin that we're able to communicate with the environment. And so sensation is very important that whether you're feeling something that's hot or cold or painful, feeling different textures, all of these components are part of sensation, right? And the skin helps us to communicate this to, to us, to our body, right? So the brain can interpret this. And then the last part as part of, uh, like what Rady said about sweat glands and thinking about blood vessels in the skin, right? We have the ability to thermoregulate or regulate body temperature, right? And that's a very important component as well. So protection, sensation, thermoregulation or temperature regulations are three main functions of the skin. Uh, Again, make sure to read this chapter in the book, look at all the pictures, all the illustrations to see uh, all of this and uh, uh, understand and review this material.